Good morning, church. Let's stand. Let's praise the Lord this morning. Good morning, church. I am so excited to be here this morning, and um, just an honor and a privilege. We actually have six baptisms this morning. Man, anytime we get one uh, that's getting baptized, it's just, uh, just amazing, but six baptisms this morning. Uh, six college-age kids will be coming, um, and uh, they know that there's nothing special about this water. Um, but that it's the first step in obedience inside of a new relationship with Jesus Christ. So this morning we've got Spencer, 
And uh, Spencer is, fun fact, he's actually a really good skateboarder. Um, but uh, Spencer uh, has, uh, has given his life to Jesus, and um, he was uh, saved uh, uh, younger, and, uh, and then has realized, you know what, the more he's grown in his faith, um, that he needed to follow through with believer's baptism. So Spencer, it is my honor, but also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus, it's upon that profession of faith that I get the opportunity to baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we have another Spitzer. And uh, very similar story, um, saved, understood. The more that he's grown in his faith uh, through our college group here has come to realize that uh, he needs to follow through with believer's baptism. And so he's come this morning to do that. So Spencer, it is my honor, but also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus. It's upon that profession of faith that I get the opportunity to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And while Whitney's coming down, I do just want to take a second and say uh, these next four are actually really good friends. They've been friends uh, since, as I've learned the story, uh, since they were children. And uh, one of them, they were kind of having a conversation around a living room, and one of them said, you'll never believe what God's done in my life. And that just kind of sparked this amazing conversation. And uh, all four of them said, you know what we should do? We should get baptized together. And so that's exactly what they did, and uh, so they're all coming forward. Uh, today. So I think that's just an amazing testimony. So I don't know what you do with your friends, but uh, this is probably better. So anyways, uh, so this is Whitney, and uh, Whitney has just come and uh, accepted Jesus, and she's following through a believer's baptism this morning. So Whitney, it is my honor, but also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? It's upon that profession of faith that I get the privilege to uh, baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right, and this is Ethan. And Ethan, it is my uh, privilege, but also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus. It's upon that profession of faith that I get the opportunity to baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is Nick. Nick, it's my privilege, but also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus. It's upon that profession of faith that I get the opportunity to baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right, and this is Landon. Landon, it's my privilege, but also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus. It's upon that profession of faith that I get the opportunity to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, we got to do that again. Isn't that just a great, great sight that we just saw there? And I started losing count there for a second. But here's one that I just saw. If anybody asks, does God still do miracles? You know, and maybe you're here today and you need a miracle. Let me just give that encouragement to you today. We had baptisms at the first service. We saw these six baptisms here. God still works. God still moves. So whatever you find yourself at today, whether you come into this place looking for an answer, looking for a miracle, are you coming to this place and maybe it's just not a habit? Let me tell you, God wants to move into your life today. That's what we're here for. Aren't you excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen? Amen.
Well, you pray for our pastor and family. Uh, he actually, him and Miss Jennifer and, and Reed and Abby have gone to Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, they got to celebrate the middle child's graduation, Emma, yesterday. And so they uh, get to see uh, their middle child graduate from college, and they'll be traveling back home today. So you pray for them. And I'm just so excited as these uh, young adults, as they are experiencing this graduation uh, this year. We've got many that are graduating. And so you pray for them. You pray for them. But again, pray for our pastor. Pray for Miss Jennifer as they travel back and, and as they continue to go through what she's going through as well. We're so excited to have you here today. We're looking forward to seeing what God's going to do, and I promise you God's going to do a mighty, mighty thing in this place today. And so open up our hearts and open up our ears, open up our minds. Let's listen to the Word of God and what God is going to tell us today. Do you know that nothing takes God by surprise? Do you know that? You know, He knows that you are here today, and you're here for a reason. I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see what God's going to do in your life today. So here's what we're getting ready to do. In just a minute, we're getting ready to take up our offering. And, and I saw this this morning, and it's kind of dawned on me what type of church we are. You know, if you look at your bulletin, you know, you'll see in there we've got baby dedication coming up. We have VBS coming up. Uh, you know, we see the student ministry happening. We see all these young adults that were baptized, which is incredible. You know, God's moving. And also right above that baby dedication announcement, we see the Forerunners event, the 55 and over. Aren't you glad that we're in a church that, you know, emphasizes from bed babies to the very end that all of us have a place? Aren't you glad to be in a church that you have a place to be, a place to belong, a purpose? Isn't that great? It, it is to me. I hope it is to you. But as we come into this time to take up our offering, here's what that means to me. Is that I think as we come to give of our tithe, give our offering, there's two things that always come to the forefront for me is one, First of all, it's an act of obedience. You know, God's called us in this time of worship to do that. And so just to do that as well, that's the reason we do it. But secondly, as we see God move through this church, we see the baptism that happens. We, we see the churches that have been started around this country, locally, around this world. You know, we see the, the opportunities that we have, no matter what life stage we're in here at this church, that this church is able to do. That starts right with obedient people. And today I'm thankful for you. I think, I'm thankful that God has brought you to this place, brought you to this, this time as we try to reach this community and this world for Christ. So I'm going to ask our usher to come forward. And as they come forward, let's just be reminded that what we're doing right now, it's an act of obedience, but even more than that, it's an act of worship as we give to the Lord. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful that we get this opportunity as a family to do this together. Let's pray. Father, right now, I just want to praise your name. I thank you that you allow us to come together as this group here this morning, this group that's a family of brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and Father, we're reminded of the miracles that you do. Father, we're thankful for these that were, that were baptized in this service and the first service and, and the reminder to each of us that you're still moving in this place. And we pray today that you move in our hearts as we continue to worship. But Father, at this specific time, we pray for this offering. We pray for those who give. Father, we pray for those who even uh, step out in faith. Maybe today is their first time to, to give a tithe. Father, we pray that you bless them. But Father, we pray that whatever is done today and during this time, that it will go to further your work here in this community around the world. And Father, that you just take this church and Father, make it the light in this community that, that you would have it to be. And Father, we give this service to you. First in Christ's name I pray. You were 
His faithfulness this morning.
sing it to him. beside us. 
God, as the song that Jen sang said, we've witnessed it again and again and again. God, so we pour out our praise to you this morning because you are the only one who is worthy. It's in the holy and precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Well, amen. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord, right? Amen. Um, been thinking about today and, and just excited about getting to share with you. I don't know about you, but I love church. I love being in church. I've been doing this since I was 16 years old, so I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but that's like 40-something years, and um, I just love being in church. We, and I love Highland Park because there's always something going on. We had all these baptisms today. Yesterday, there were four or five things happening all over the place that had to do with our church, and so there's just something that's always going on. There was this pastor. He had served his church for over 30 years. He was getting on up there like me, and he, um, he thought, you know what? I need to mix it up a little bit. I need to, you know, try something new. So they got to the end of a service, and uh, he was about to dismiss, and he, he, he said, uh, congregation, I want to tell you, next week, I'm going to preach on the sin of lying. And so what I want you to do is kind of prepare for that. I want you to read Mark 17. And so everybody kind of shook their heads, and he prayed, and, and they were dismissed. And so the week rocked on, and he, he, he prepared his message. And so it came that Sunday, and the music had finished, and he came up to preach, and he said, you know what? Before I continue, he said, I, I'd like to know how many of y'all got to read Mark 17? And he said, hands just went all up, all over the auditorium, all over the auditorium. He said, that's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so very much. He said, you know, it's really amazing and, and maybe a little odd because Mark only has 16 chapters. <laughs> now I'm going to preach my sermon online. You know, we all have, we all have weaknesses, right? We all, have, we all fall short and come short of the glory of God. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And I don't know about you, but that last sentence is really important, correct? Um, one of the things that I love about the churches that I've served, and especially here, is Vacation Bible School. And when I, when I think about Vacation Bible School, I taught fifth grade for a long time. And if, if you've not signed up for Vacation Bible School, I bet Miss Tammy would really appreciate it if you would. Her and her team do an amazing job. It's just a great, great week. We'll have probably over 1,000 kids here, and that means a thousand families that we'll touch and so it's really important that we do this and we'll see kids come to know the Lord which is great but something I really enjoy about kids and I do children's choir here too is that they'll just tell you anything they'll just lay it out for you right and so when you're talking to kids you want to do that too you want to make it real clear and plain so quite a few years ago and I don't remember where I got it but this is the definition of sin that I use when I'm talking to kids actually I use it whoever I'm talking to but sin is when we do something that God said not to do and or it's we don't do something that God told us to do. That's the only two ways we can sin, right? We do something that God told us not to or we don't, don't do something that God told us to do. The sin that I want to share with you today has been said, I read in an article not too long ago in a Christian magazine that it's, it's the most prolific sin of Christians today. And I'll share with you what that is and we're going to go into it, but uh, it's, it's sort of that way, and it sort of even makes sense with all the 24-hour the news cycle and uh, all the things that we can stream now, and we all have our tablets and phones, and that, so there's just, we have, we're bombarded with information. So I want to share with you Philippians 4, 4 through 9, and it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we're going to look at those two kinds of sin. The very first part of this verse, it's, they're both commands, but the first part is what to do. What to do. Do you remember what it is? Rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul was so emphatic about it, he said, and again, I say rejoice. Now, for some of us, we just kind of read over that. We just kind of gloss right past it, right? Oh, that's nice. We need to rejoice in the Lord. No, God's saying to do it. So if we don't do that, it's called sin, okay? And so the next part is something that we are not to do. We are not, as believers, we're not to worry, okay? And that sounds really difficult uh, for some of us, and I'm one of those people 
that worry sometimes, and I've had trouble with that through the years, but not to worry. And then it comes with a promise. If you'll rejoice in the Lord always and you won't worry, what do you get out of that? You get the peace of God, and the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There was this young man, he had just graduated from college, he wanted to be an accountant, and he had gotten all his certifications, and he was ready to go. And so <clears throat> he called um, a couple of places, you know, trying to get an interview, and finally one said, yes, we, we want you to come for the interview. And so he goes to the, the business, and they have him out in the waiting room, and a receptionist comes and says, look, the boss is running a little late, but he wants you to wait in his office. So he goes, and he sits in the office, and he starts looking around, and you know, pictures aren't quite straight. There's paper all over the desk, and the file cabinets are kind of open. Just doesn't look real organized. And then all of a sudden, bam, through the back door, the boss comes in, and his suit is kind of rumpled, and his tie's crooked, and it looks like he's been messing with his hair, and he goes, whew, sits in the desk, and he goes, whew, busy, busy day. And the guy says, well, I'm, I'm here for the interview. He said, I know who you are. I read your resume. I, I'm ready. I know what you're, you're here for, and I think you might be the guy for the job. And the young man was kind of taken aback. He said, well, that's awesome. He said, now, wait a minute. He said, before we go any further, I want you to know, I do want you to be, and we're looking for an accountant, and the job is about accounting, but I, I got to tell you, I'm a busy, busy man, and I have tons of worries. I have to worry about everything. And so whoever takes this job is going to take all the worrying about finances on, him, on himself. That way, I don't have to worry about it. And that's the only way I'm hiring somebody, if they take all the worries. So the young man thought, he said, they didn't teach me that in business school. And so he's thinking, and he's thinking, he said, well, well how much does something like that pay? And he said, well, we're, we're prepared right today to offer you $100,000 a year. The young man thought, and he said, how on earth can a small business like this afford $100,000 a year? And he said, that young man is your first worry. <laughs> That's the way we are, right? It'd be great to have somebody worry for us. And you know what? We have somebody. His name is Jesus. We can put, cast all our cares on him. I don't know, you may be the exception, but, you know, if we have a job, we're worried about losing a job. If we don't have a job, we're worried about getting one. If we have money, we're worried about where it's going to go. If we don't have money, we're worried about getting some. If we're sick, we worry. And that's probably the worst thing. I think there's been articles and articles about you shouldn't worry about being sick. You really shouldn't worry at all. It makes you sick. So worry is one of those things. Uh, Kathy and I had just moved um, to Brandon, Mississippi. It was our second church out of seminary. We were there for a number of years. And it was the fastest growing um, county in Mississippi at the time. And also the church was one of the top 100 churches, fastest growing churches in America. And so there were lots of young couples, lots of kids just like here. It was just booming, and it was a great, great time to be there. I was in my, we were in our early 30s, and so we befriended some folks there, of course, and there were these two men uh, that, that became friends of mine, and both were entrepreneurs, and to be honest, I'd just never been around somebody like that before, so I really didn't know exactly what they did, that sort of thing, but we were at a fellowship one day, and one of the men comes to me and says, hey, I'd really uh, like to come and, and, and maybe talk with you. And I said, well, okay, well, what are we talking about? He said, well, I need some business advice. And I was thinking, I'm the guy for you. you know, I, that's, that's who you need to come see. But anyway, so we made the appointment, and uh, just 30 minutes later, the other guy comes to me, not knowing the first one came. And he says, uh, Wayne, I, I've just really been thinking about it. You're one of my pastors, and I, I'd just really, really like to come get some advice from you about my business. And again, I thought, what, Lord, what are you doing, right? What's going on? So we made, the, we made the appointment, and so the next day, the first guy comes in. And so we pray, and then I say, okay, what's, what are you thinking? And he said, well, I own five businesses, and they're all doing good. And I really only knew he owned one, a fast food chain there in town. But he owned five, and he sort of told me about them. He said, they're all going great. I've got a manager for each one. You know, we've been doing this for a number of years, and it's just great. And so my mind's clicking, like, what's the problem? Sounds like you're doing super. He said, well, it's like this. He said, my best friend in the world who um, we graduated from college together, has a Fortune 500 company that he developed over the last 10 years, and um, he wants me to come and be the chief financial officer. And he said, Wayne, it's an aw just an awesome opportunity. It's, it's, it comes with great benefits, travel, uh, and it pays $5 million a year. And I thought, again, what's the problem? Take that job. <laughs> um, but, you know, I held back and acted like I knew what I was doing. And I said, well, you know, you've prayed about it, right? And he said, yeah. He said, well, we just cannot come to a conclusion. And he said, Wayne, 
and he's, he's real calm about this. He's not, he's not uptight about it at all. He's, he's, and he sought the Lord, which was, which was great. He said, um, he said, what would you do? And I said, well, you know, you did the first thing. That's the most important. You talked to the Lord. He, I said, second, I, I think I would think about how would that affect me? How would that affect you uh, with your relationship to God? And he said, honestly, it wouldn't affect it at all. I mean, we'd have to move and that sort of thing. But the man that owns the business is a, is a Christian. He's a believer. And so, you know, it just wouldn't affect it. Uh, we, we, we would work that out. And then I said, well, how would it affect you and your family? And he said the same thing. He said, you know, he's a family man. He understands. He said, I would have the staff, you know, to take care of that. I would just have to be making those big decisions. And he said, that's, you know, what I've done all my life. And so we prayed again. And I said, hey, we're not going to come to a conclusion today. Why don't you go home, pray about it, and come back? About 30 minutes later, the other guy comes in. And uh, we pray. Now, he's, he's nervous. He's kind of, you know, putting his hands together. He's kind of thinking about it. And you can tell he even has maybe a bead of sweat kind of coming down his cheek. And I can tell he's been, he's been worried about it. So I talked to him about worry, and we talked some more. And I said, okay, what's, what's the deal? He said, well, I own these two corporations or two, two businesses, and I want to buy this third one that's just come available. And my, my dream has always been to have this corporation. It's going to be, he, he explained it to me. I don't know that I understood all of it, but it sounded great. And again, I'm kind of thinking, well, what's the big deal? You know, I mean, this sounds like what you want to do. And he said, but there's a lot of risk. And as you know, anything that's worth something is, comes with risk. And I said, you know, you, you just got to seek the Lord. And so he said, well, geez, honestly, you can tell me, what would you do? And I said, well, strange you should ask. I just told somebody a minute ago, the first thing I would do is how does it change my relationship with the Lord? And he said, well, it really wouldn't. He said, I'm a deacon here at the church. I'm going to stay at the church. I've already picked out the guy that's going to take the other job. We're going to come together and make this corporation. It's going to be fantastic, you know, if that's what I do. And I said, okay, well, how would it affect your family? Again, I'm a family man, love my wife, love my kids. We're going to make time for family either way. I said, okay. And he said, but I just can't make a decision. And he's, he's uptight. So we pray again. He leaves. We co co goes by. The first guy comes in. And he said, the first thing we prayed, and then he said, Wayne, thank you so much. You're the greatest. You're awesome. He wasn't quite that exuberant about it but he he was he was all into it there for a minute you know and he said you've just brought clarity to, to my situation I just can't my wife and I just can't thank you enough and the whole time I'm thinking I did absolutely nothing and I didn't but I said okay you, you've got me going here so like, what are you gonna do and he said well he said we've decided we're gonna stay and we're gonna develop our five businesses maybe get into some more it's just what we think the Lord would have us to do and I said do you think that guy would hire me for five million dollars <laughs> I, I didn't do that so, and then, so, so we prayed, and, and he went out just as calm as he was before. The other guy comes in. He's still a little uptight. We start talking. And he starts saying the same thing, which is funny to me as a minister, and, and I was young in the ministry then. But sometimes we're that person that stands in the gap for somebody and just points somebody to Jesus. And that's what I tried to do with these two guys. And he says the same thing. Wayne, you're so awesome. I'm so glad you're one of our pastors. And you just brought so much ease and, and comfort and, and, and clarity to what we needed to decide. And I said, okay, well, what did you decide? And he said, we're going to buy the business. My lawyers are already drawing up the papers. By the end of next week, it'll be done, and we'll, we'll form this corporation. And, and he's been very successful, and both those guys have. Both the guys did the right thing. They went to God first, right? One was a little more nervous, maybe worried about it a little bit. The other didn't seem to be worried at all. We all come at it in a different way. But think about it. One warrior said to another, I have so many troubles that if anything happened to me today, it would take me two weeks to get around to worrying about it. That's a lot of worries, right? So I want to talk to you about three different kinds of worry, three different kinds of worry. The first one is people worry about things that have already happened. Now think about that. You probably can think of one of those things you worry about. But it's just like saw and sawdust. It gets you absolutely nothing. It's useless. There's nothing about it. Now, if that worry includes sin, then, of course, you take that to the Lord and you get forgiveness. And then you go to the person that maybe you offended and you, and you fix that. That's one thing. But the worry shouldn't be there. And so there's that worry about things that have already happened. And then secondly, people worry about things that are inevitable, that inevitably happen. Think about that for a second. I have this aunt. She passed away a few years ago. It's my favorite aunt. Her, her youngest daughter was probably my best friend through my teenage years. And when we were 8 and 10, 
we would get together at her house. They lived uh, across the bridge in Lake Village, Arkansas, and they lived on the lake, and they had BB guns and 22 rifles and all kinds of slingshots. We did everything you can imagine. But my aunt would come pick us up sometimes and pick me up to join them, and we'd, you know, have a weekend together, and we'd ride in her old Pinto, and it shook and, and, and made funny noises. And so we, we, we would go in that Pinto, and we would sing songs. And it was around Christmas time at that, that point in time, one of the reasons I do love Christmas, because she always sang and sang and sang. So we're singing all these songs, but we get up on the bridge, and if you've ever been on that bridge uh, between Greenville, Mississippi, and um, Lake Chico, Arkansas, it's, uh, it goes right over the Mississippi. And so we're looking at the Mississippi, and it kind of gets quiet. And I, I look over at my aunt, she starts getting this sad face. And I'm thinking, she's never sad, never. And so all of a sudden, almost in a cry voice, she said, oh, she said, you know, you, you two are going to grow up and you're going to marry somebody and you're going to marry And I'm like, I'm eight years old. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then she says, and you might marry the wrong person and you might have to get a divorce and your kids might be bad. And she just goes on and on. And again, I'm, I'm, we're both looking at each other like we're eight and seven here. I don't know. She didn't do that all the time, but she really fretted there for a little bit, and occasionally she would do it. But that's, that's worrying about something that's just going to happen. Our kids are going to grow up. They're probably going to get married. Things are going to happen. Another thing we worry about is death, and, and I can understand that, right? But death is one of those things that, that we'll all experience unless Jesus comes back before then. One of my favorite um, cartoons is um, uh, Peanuts. I couldn't get it out there for a minute. Sorry about that. Uh, Charlie Brown and Snoopy are sitting on the dock and they're fishing. I think we've got a picture of it. And um, Charlie Brown's a downer, right? It's a beautiful, sunshiny day. And he says, someday we will all die, Snoopy. And Snoopy looks back at him and says, true, but on all the other days we will not. We got one day at a time, so let's take it, right? That's, those things are inevitable. So we've got things that have already happened, things that are inevitable, and then uh, things that will never happen. Uh, a survey that I read in that same article I was telling you about said that as much as 40 to 80 percent of the things people worry about never ever happen. How silly, right? There was this couple, they've been married 40 years. I'm, we're working on our 38th. Next week we'll be married 38 years. And uh, so I kind of can understand, except at my house this story goes more like it's me doing this, but you'll get the picture here in a second. But anyway, this couple had been married 40 years, and every night, 365 days a year, every night the husband would almost get in bed or be in bed, and the wife would say, did you check the alarm? Did you check the lock on the door? Did you check the windows? All that sort of thing. And so every night he would get up and go out. And he had to admit that some nights he would just kind of walk down the hall and wait there a minute and then go back and get in the bed and say he checked it because he knew he already checked it, right? And so, again, 40 years. So 40 years into it, same thing. He's got his pajamas on. He's so tired. He's almost jumping into bed. And the wife says, did you check the alarm? Did you check the doors? Did you check the windows? And he thought, you know what? Love of my life, I'm going to go do it. So he goes, goes down the stairs. He checks the door. He checks the windows. He checks the alarm. Everything's fine. Goes back upstairs. Gets in bed. They go to sleep. About 1 o'clock that morning, uh, the wife is, is awakened to a noise. And so she does what every wife would. She starts shaking her husband. And he, he opens his eyes, and she said, I hear something. And he sort of rolls his eyes and is like, yeah, right. But then he hears it. So he grabs his baseball bat, and he walks down the stairs, you know, kind of making sure what's going on. Gets all the way to the bottom of the stairs, flips on the light, and there in the living room is this guy all in black. He's got a mask. And they both just stare at each other, and they're terrified for a second, right? Guy's got stuff, you know, he's taken out of the house. And then it hits the guy with the bat. He puts his bat down. He says, you know what? I am so glad you're here. Could you come up and meet my wife? She's been waiting on you for 40 years. <laughs> 365 days a year for 40 years, this lady worried about this one time something happened. One time. Matthew 6, 25 through 34 talks about, Paul talks about all the different things we can worry about. And so I want to read that to you. It's a, it's a longer verse, but it's so, so good. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? 
And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And then verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So why shouldn't we worry, according to these verses? Worry first is unnecessary. I love that verse 27. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? You know, the stories, true stories, uh, are, are more interesting and sometimes more crazy than uh, fiction, right? And this is a true story. I was in uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. Carl was our um, education and administrative pastor. Pastor Stephen was our youth pastor, and we've been friends ever since. And anyway, during that time, Texas was going through some changes as far as Baptist was going, and they developed the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, which, was, which is now and, and was then the conservative convention in, in uh, Texas. And so for a couple of years, the first couple of years of that convention, for some w weird reason, they made me the music guy. And so I'd have to fly to Dallas every once in a while and for meetings. And we'd had our first convention. We're about to have our second. This was like in the middle of the summer. If you know anything about Corpus Christi, it's hot all the time. It's really, really hot. And so it was one of those weeks, and all of us have had them. I was like, I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to stay home. But I got to get on this plane and, and go to this meeting. And so I'm in my, my coat and tie, and I get to the airport. And I get my ticket, and I look on my ticket, and I go, oh, great, I'm in the back of the plane. And this was before they had the, the uh, little jets, they had the prop planes. And so you kind of had to get up in the air before the air conditioner worked. So if they put you on the tarmac, you know, and so I'm already in this negative mode. You ever been there? And I'm thinking, oh, we're going to be on the tarmac forever. I'm going to be a sweaty mess, you know, for my meeting. It's terrible. And so, sure enough, we get on the plane, we get out on the tarmac, and the, pa the uh, pastor, the, <laughs> the pilot says, uh, hey, uh, you know, we're going to be here a minute. We haven't been cleared for takeoff. So we, we sit there a minute, and uh, it takes about 15 minutes, and we get good and hot. And then finally he says, okay, we're ready to go, and we're going to take off. And so we do. We get up in the air, and we just about get comfortable that the, the AC is working pretty good. And there was this lady sitting by me, and we would kind of, you know, talk to each other. She was on her way to a meeting. I was on my way to a meeting. We get up and we're both kind of relieved that now we have some AC. And so about the time we get comfortable, the pilot comes back on and says, hey, I hate to tell you. I mean, anytime the pilot says, I hate to tell you, it's probably not good. He said, we're going to have to go around this storm and then we're going to land, kind of go under it to land in Dallas. I don't know what all that means, but I heard storm and that all I could think of was the turbulence thing. And I get kind of you know, uh, stick in my stomach when that, that happens, motion sickness. And so this plane starts doing this. And I'm trying to think of everything in the world because I don't want to get sick on this plane. And so then I think, hey, I haven't really talked to this lady. Maybe if I talk to her, it'll get my mind off of it and, and we can get past this, this point in time where we have this turbulence. So we get to talking and I, I look over and she's got the tray table down and she's holding it so tight and her knuckles are white. And I said, hey, are you okay? And she goes, no, I'm not okay. I hate flying. Why do I have to do this? I don't want to go to this meeting. And she just keeps going. And I said, hey, hey, let's, can we pray about it? Could we just pray? She said, yeah, that'd be good. So I pray, and I pray for the pilot. I pray for our landing. I pray for this turbulence to quit. I pray for her. And she continues to hold on to this. And she said, hey, by the way, what, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. I'm a worship pastor. And I'm actually on the team to plan the Southern Baptist of Texas convention meeting coming up in the fall and I'm going down for a meeting up for a meeting and um, you know then I'll be back home to lead worship and so we continue to talk and I really wasn't paying much attention but I look over and her tray tables up and she's calm and we're, this plane is still doing this and I'm still feeling kind of sick and I just got curious I go ma'am what on earth you know like just a minute ago you were so upset and you know now you you're 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 at peace and I was thinking the prayer you know whatever 
And she says, oh, it's easy. He said, you know, you're going to do the Southern Baptist Convention, a Southern Baptist of Texas Convention meeting, and then you got to come back and lead worship. God's not taking you out, so I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really did. I laughed. It was so funny. I thought, you know, you've got enough faith that God's going to take care of me, <laughs> but you didn't have enough faith to think God was going to take care of you. So first, worry is unnecessary. Number two, worry is cruel. And you think about it. If you're worried all the time, think about your family and friends who are around you, your coworkers, and we've all been around somebody like that. And if you don't know somebody like that, you're probably that person, right? So it doesn't do us any good, right? And it's cruel, but it's also cruel to God because it shows a lack of faith, and we don't want to do that. And then worry is prohibited. In other words, it's sin for a believer to worry, as we've, as we've said. There's an old saying that says, God will never give you more than you can handle. And I learned a word in, um, in Greek uh, when I was at seminary that, that explains this verse. It's called baloney. That's not, what that, that, that's not what God said. But what God means is this. God will never give you anything he can't handle. And that's the point. We need him in every situation. Nothing that he can't handle. Absolutely nothing. So as Christians, we're not to worry. It's futile. It doesn't do us any good. It's sin. And it shows a huge lack of faith. In this article I read, uh, it was a, a Barna group that does surveys and stuff, and I don't remember how many people that it was over, but they took 100% of things. So if you had 100,000 worries or you had 10 worries, it's all up in this 100% uh, deal. And so in their calculation of all the people that they surveyed, approximately 40% of the things of that 100% don't, aren't ever going to happen. So I don't know about you, but as a person who's worried in his life, if I could take 40% of that 100 off, man, that would be grand. So now we're down to 60% of the things that we worry about that maybe we have a, we should, you know. But then there's 30% of those things that we just plain out can't, that we can't change or happened in the past. So now we're taking 70% off of all the things that we worried about, and we've, we're down to um, 30%. Well, 12% of, according to this, according to the average person, 12% are criticisms of others, and a lot of us worry about that, don't we? Especially with Facebook and somebody says something bad about us and we just worry about it. Well, you know what? We can't do anything much about that anyway, so why worry? And then 10% is about health, and just like I said, no point in worrying about health. It just makes you sick. So that leaves us 8% of things that maybe we could say we could worry about. But we left out the most important factor, Jesus. We don't have to worry because he wants to take all those worries. Just like that guy wanted to give his worries to that accountant, he wants us to put all our burdens on him. When I was in the seventh grade, uh, I had to do a, a book report. And I picked a book on Connie Mack. And honestly, in the seventh grade, I would imagine I picked that book because it was the thinnest book on the shelf, you know. But it was really interesting, and it caught my attention, and I've kept that in my head all this, and I, I did look it up again just to be sure I had the facts right. But he was, he was a great baseball manager, and he was known for his ability to inspire young men. And uh, one year when he had already clinched the pennant, he went to his best two pitchers, and he said, you know what, I want you to take the next 10 days off. Just get ready for the World Series. And so the... Um, the first guy went to every game, and he kind of, you know, strategized and kept up with what was going on. And the second guy went fishing every day, didn't think a care about baseball for those 10 days. And when they came back to Connie Mack, they asked him, wasn't that kind of an odd thing to do? And he goes, not, not at all. He said, because they both played great, and, and we won the World Series. He learned that uh, he would never discuss mistakes uh, of a player with other people. He would just talk to that player, and he'd wait 24 hours to do that. In the first year, three years of his Major League Baseball career, Connie Mack came in sixth, seventh, and eighth. And because of that, he demoted himself to the minor leagues to better learn how to handle uh, the players. One of his secrets, and you've got to think about this, this is from a secular biography that I read a long, long time ago. But I, 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 it, it, it's, it's always come back to me. He said this, he discovered that worry was threatening to wreck his baseball career. That's, again, from a secular view, not even taking Jesus into account, right? I saw how foolish it was, and I forced myself to get busy preparing to win the next game, not worried about the games I didn't win or we didn't win. He said this, you can't grind grain with water that has already gone down the creek. So think about it just for a second. If 
you worry about dying and you don't die, you didn't have anything to worry about. If you think about or worry about dying and you do die and you end up in heaven, hey, right? To, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, for those of us who don't know Christ, that's who I'm going to talk to a little later. But maybe you don't understand this, and you'll have some questions later. We will have staff around uh, to talk to us. God doesn't want us to worry. So how can we start not worrying? And we go back to those, the scripture that we read in Matthew. Number one, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And I want to say kind of duh right there, right? I want you to be like those guys that I talked to. What's the first thing you do when that worry pops up? Do you call your mama? Do you call your best friend? Who do you call, right? No, you, you go to God. Go to God every time. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then number two, replace worry with prayer and acknowledge God. Sort of the same idea. But my favorite uh, scripture in the Bible, uh, and I go to it anytime I am even kind of go there, is Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. It says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than I could ever ask for or imagine, through the power that is within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for genera to all generations forever and ever. Think about those first few words. Now to him who is able, now, 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 not tomorrow, not next week, right this instant, what? He, who, God, is able. And then you take that word able. He's able right now, but what does able mean? For most of us, we think about able as he's able to write something or he can write a song or whatever he's able to do. But for God, it's not a finite thing. It's infinite, whatever you can come up with. Uh, the Apostle Paul put it this way, he's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. I don't know about you, but I can ask for a whole lot of things. I can imagine a whole lot of things. But that's just a little grain of sand compared to God's imagination and what he's able to do. And then number three, count your blessings. And uh, you've probably heard that song, Count Your Many Blessings. We used to sing it at Thanksgiving all the time. And uh, name them one by one. So I want to challenge you, when you leave this place today, what if you got with your, your spouse or your child or your grandchild and you just wrote down, the things that you're, you are thankful for, the things, you're, the things that God has blessed you with. That could be any and everything. Just do that this week. It'll, it'll take some of those worries off. And then take comfort in the Lord. Jesus loves you so much that he died on a cross for you. He rose again. Um, he ascended to heaven. He's coming back for us someday. Take great comfort in that. Compared to that, what do we really have to be worried about? And then live one day at a time. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Yesterday is dead, tomorrow is yet unborn, and we have only today. Um, I want to kind of close with Isaiah 26. It says this, You, Lord, keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. We'll read that one more time. You, Lord, Keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. What if you put your name in there? I'm going to put my name in there and you just insert your name, name as I read it. You, Lord, keep Wayne in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, Lord, because Wayne trusts in you. Maybe today you don't know Jesus as your Savior. I don't, in a room this big, there's probably somebody here who, who hasn't accepted Christ as Savior. Maybe you have a question about that. We're going to have pastors here at the front in just a minute. But I want to take just a minute, and if everyone would, just bow your head and close your eyes. And we're just going to go to the Lord. If, if you don't know Christ, would you, if you're willing to and you want to know him, all you have to do is say something like this. Put it in your own words and talk straight to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I'm in need of a Savior. Lord Jesus, I know that you're that Savior, and I ask you to come into my heart and life as Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you pray that prayer, it's not magical or any of those things, but if you meant it, then you're part of the family of God, and please come share that with one of our ministers. If you maybe haven't 